So that is Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 7, page 1065 in the Red Pew Bibles. So, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for forty years they saw what I did. This is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As, it just, as has just been said, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Stephanie. Would you pray with me once more as we come to God's word? Let's pray together. Father, we pause in these moments before you. And we just want to quiet our soul before you and open ourselves to you and ask that even in the midst of all the distractions in our world and in our life, that you would allow us to hear from you, to see you, to give our attention to you, and that by your Spirit you would take your Word, which you say is powerful and active and able to change us and give us life. Would you take your Word, use it upon our hearts, and bring us into your rest, that we would find rest in Jesus. Would you come and do that this morning? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, uh, kids, my kids are not here today, so I can't look look at them and put them on the spot, but there's some kids scattered around in here, so we'll start with a question for kids this morning. Here's a question for you. Do you ever feel too busy? <laughs> I see one, oh yeah, up here. You ever feel just overwhelmed by life and everything you got to do? You ever feel that? Some of the bliss of childhood is that sometimes you don't feel that, right? But I think interestingly in our culture, we actually see that busyness beginning to trickle down into the lives of our kids. Maybe here's another question. Do you ever long for rest? Do you ever long to be able to just get away, go on vacation, get away from everything in life? And that's why snow day is so fun, right? I love snow days. You know, I love just that unexpected, out of nowhere, you know, you think you're going to work, you think you've got all this stuff to do, and then the snow hits, and it's like, all that's off. Rest. Just rest day. That's what snow day is, right? You know, I had um, one of my good friends, Eric Youngblood, senior pastor at Rock Creek Fellowship, whenever I got to work alongside him for five years, and we would always get in this kind of debate about snow days, because, you know... He dreaded them. He hated them. I'm like, how can somebody not like a snow day? It's like free, you know? All responsibilities are off. And he said, I hate them. And I said, why? And he said, because all that stuff I had to do that day is just piled up for the next one. And I'm like, ooh. Yeah, I guess I know what you're talking about. There's something in us that craves rest. 
something in just who we are. But yet at the same time, there's something in us that resists rest, that seeks rest in things, and we never quite seem to find it. We never quite seem to get to that place where it's like, yes. You ever come back from a vacation and you're like, man, I need a vacation. (laughs) I feel that all the time. You know, it's like, you know, with five kids, I need a vacation from my vacation. But one of the things about life is that we, especially in our culture, is that we're so busy. We are crazy busy. What is the thing, what is the, like, nine times out of ten, you get this response when if you ask somebody, maybe you've done that this morning, you see somebody and you say, hey, how you been? What is the number one answer you will hear? Busy. Like, I've been busy. I'm good, but I've been so busy. That's what we share all the time because that's the reality of our life. We are crazy busy in our culture. And we have an incredibly hard time with rest. And what's made it even harder in modern life is that we can't get away from our technology. We go into our rest. I find this, whenever I set aside some time and I'm like, okay, I'm going to rest. I'm going to get away. What do I end up doing in my rest? Well, let me just check emails for a minute, right? Let me, let me maybe get a few things done in this time of rest. Let me catch up a little bit on what i got to do tomorrow. And so often we're seeking rest in technology, in escape, in these things that don't deliver. You know, how often are you just sitting alone in quiet without any stimulation? I know that for me, not very often. And it's incredibly hard. In fact, sometimes I'll set aside that time and I'll find myself checking things, researching things on my phone. Right? It is so hard to experience rest in the crazy business of our life. We are such in a hurry in our life and in our world. You know, for me, here's what happens for me. So... Not only is it work for me, but it's the way that I go about work. I have a fundamental kind of approach to work and ministry and life where deeply I believe it's up to me. That I've got to make it happen. I've got to come through. And so that takes normal work to like a, an extra level of burden, if you can relate to that. And so what happens in my life is I start to get exhausted and more and more exhausted. And what I try to do whenever to relieve myself of the exhaustion is I try to escape. That's for me where I try to find rest. I, for me, the most restful thing that I can imagine is just being utterly relieved of all responsibility. You know, I, it's like personal escape. It's like being alone, not being around any other people, not being anything I have to do, and like escaping into some kind of entertainment. Just numbing out. Can you relate to that? You know what I've found by that? Even though I so deeply believe this is going to give me rest, rarely does it really deliver the rest I crave. Oftentimes, after I'm seeking rest in that, I just feel even more empty. What do you run to to try to find rest? And are you worn out and busy with life? So as we come to our passage today... It's amazing, right here we're working through the book of Hebrews. These next two chapters are all about rest. Now that might be a little surprising to you. Wait a minute, the Bible's about rest? I thought it was about always doing more and working harder. Yeah, that's how we kind of think of it in modern evangelicalism, right? Let's get really, really busy. God wants us to do that, right? But these next two chapters are about rest, and we're going to talk about that today and next week. So today as we come to our passage, we're going to see two things. What is the barrier to rest in our life? What keeps us from the kind of rest that we crave? And then secondly, we're going to see how do we find true, soul-satisfying rest? That's what we'll see in our passage. So let's jump in here. And now as we come to this passage, and what he's doing here in the passage is he is talking about a particular psalm. He's talking about Psalm 95. That's what he quotes here. And he's going to teach on Psalm 95. But Psalm 95 is about the experience of the Israelites 
in the Exodus, in the Old Testament. And the Exodus was kind of a story that just defined who they were. It defined their life. So we're going we're gonna to look at that because that's kind of the background of this. But before we go there, I just want to talk for a minute about God and rest. Now, this is a huge theme in the Bible, believe it or not, this aspect of rest. In fact, we find it showing up at the very beginning of creation. Genesis chapter 1, whenever God makes all things... He's creating the world. He's creating everything on our planet. He's creating human beings. And then on the seventh day, what does God do? He rested. That's amazing to me. You know, God didn't rest because He was worn out. He rested because that's what He does. Rest for God was a sense of enjoying His creation. And right there at the very beginning of the Bible, through His own pattern of creation and rest, He sets the pattern for His people. That we would work six days, and then on the seventh, we would rest. And rest that He has commanded us to, I mean, amazingly, it becomes one of the Ten Commandments. Now think about that. What kind of a God says, I command you to rest? He is the God of rest. He invites us into His rest. We have been created with limitations. We cannot work without rest. We we have limits. We don't like limits. We're always pushing them. We're always wishing that we didn't have them. But sooner or later, you're going to run into your limits and you're going to crash. And I find myself doing that all the time. And it's because God made us for rest. And in fact, the very story of Israel was about rest. If you know the Exodus story, you know that God's people were in slavery in Egypt. Slavery is very different than rest. Slavery was this reality of being driven harder and harder in work. That was their experience in Egypt under their slave master Pharaoh. He was constantly driving the Israelites to do more and more and more. Most of us can't even imagine what it would be like to be enslaved, although we, maybe we do know something about being enslaved. But they were enslaved. They were always working in their toil and in their burden. And God hears their cries. They cry out to God. God hears their cries. And He comes down in order to deliver His people. And He frees them from their slavery in Egypt through the blood of a lamb. Wait a minute. Maybe this story is about something even much larger. Maybe it's about our own story. And it absolutely is. It's the story of the Gospel. That God would free us from the slavery of sin to this world through the blood of Jesus to bring us into His rest. The Exodus story is our story. But God frees them from their slavery in Egypt. He brings them through the wilderness to prepare them for the land of Canaan, for the promised land, which He describes over and over and over in the Old Testament, this is my rest. God's intention for God's people in rescuing them out of slavery was to bring them into His rest. That was the description of the promised land. That as they came into there, it would be a place of flourishing. It would be a place where they would experience the rest of God, that they would know a rhythm of work and resting in God. But here's one of the things that you see in their story. They couldn't rest. It's amazing. Isn't that interesting? As we look at the Israelites as they're making their way through the wilderness, they could not rest. Because you see, deeply they believed it was all up to them. You know, God's like, I want you to rest on the Sabbath. And they're like, I, I can't do it. I've got to work. And they go out and they're, you know, they're trying to do this and do that. They were rebelling against God. They would not trust God. They would not follow Him. Because it... It had to be up to them. And so as he tells us here, God became angry with this generation that they fell under God's judgment and that he promises on oath, verse 11, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. That generation of Israelites fell under God's judgment. They were not able to enter the rest of the promised land. In fact, that whole generation would fall and would die in the wilderness. So the writer of Hebrews is holding out that example. 
He's like, they didn't enter His rest. But I want you to. I want you to know the rest of God. So the question is, what was their barrier? What is our barrier to rest? What keeps us from entering the rest that God has designed and called us to? And this, you see this, the answer to this, it's, it's throughout the passage. But he tells us right off the bat, in verse 8, it was the hardness of their heart. Look again at what he says. Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. The reason that they turned away from God, the reason that they were not able to enter and experience God's rest was because their hearts were hard. That shows up a number of times in the passage. What does this mean? This hardness of heart. As we come to the Bible, it talks about our heart all the time. The heart is kind of the, the seat of the person. It's who you are. It's all of your thoughts and your emotions and your will and your choices and desires. All of that, the very core of who you are, that is your heart. But the problem with the Israelites was their hearts became hard. What does it mean to have a hard heart? It means that you cannot feel. That's what happens whenever something hardens. It cannot be affected. It cannot be touched. It cannot be uh, manipulated. It cannot change. It's hard, like a rock. You can't do much with a rock. With Play-Doh, you know, if you ever played with Play-Doh, it's, it's, you can manipulate it, you can move it, you can change it, it's soft. But, but something that's hard, it cannot be affected. It cannot feel. And a part of what happens in us is that we experience pain in life and hardship in life and busyness in life and difficulty in life. And what we begin to do is we begin to harden our hearts. If you think about a callus, you know, if you ever had a callus, you know, a callus begins to form whenever something is being irritated, something is experiencing pain, some, you know, maybe it begins with a blister. There's something that is experiencing pressure and hardship. It's, it's experiencing pain. And what does the body begin to do? It begins to form a callus. It begins to harden. And when you have a callus, you know you can no longer feel. That's the whole concept, right? It's to protect from pain. That's what begins to happen in our hearts. That whenever we experience hard things in our life, whenever we feel betrayal, whenever we experience a disappointment in life, whenever we uh, experience a breakdown in a relationship, whenever we go through hardship in life, whenever we just are broken down on the wheels of life, what is the most natural tendency for us to do? Is to harden and shut down our hearts. Because here's the thing, life hurts. Pain hurts. And you know, there's always the option that whenever you experience pain and hardship in your life, to run to God with that. But so often what we choose to do is to shut our hearts down. To callous over our hearts. To where we can no longer feel. We cannot be affected by other people. Whenever our hearts are shut down, we cannot enter in and feel with other people. You, you cannot feel emotion. You just begin to go through life and listen, if you're busy, this has probably already begun to happen in your life. That you've just begun to be hard because listen, if you're going to feel, if your heart is going to be open, if it's going to be soft, then you've got to slow down because things are going to affect you. Your capacity is going to go down. So what do we do? We harden our hearts. In the busyness of life, in the difficulty of life, in the pain of life, we harden our hearts. We can no longer feel. We can no longer hear from God. We can no longer hear from one another. So the question is, how does that hardening happen? Where does it come from? And again, he shows us this a number of places, but I just want to bring you to verse 13, where he says this, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you, here it is, may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. What hardens our hearts? Sin's deceitfulness. It's sin that hardens our hearts. 
You know, in sin, you know, whenever we hear the concept sin, we probably, what we probably think of is like breaking God's rules. You know, there's a couple of rules out there, and we should avoid those things, and that's what sin is. So, you know, don't be doing any of those things, and, and, and that's what it means to avoid sin. But sin is far more deep and all-encompassing. Sin is literally making life work apart from God. Sin is choosing to go your own way. It's saying, yeah, I see what God has called me to. I see how He's called me to live. I see how He's called me to do relationships with other people. I see that, but yet I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do it my way. I'm, I'm going to choose to make life work in my own strength and through my own strategies. That is sin. And it's always deceptive. Sin is deceptive. It holds something out. It does not deliver. It's always the way that it is with sin. You know, always in sin, it's thinking, you know, this, this is going to give me life. You know, by, by living this way or choosing this or going back to this behavior in my life, this is going to, it's going to bring life. It's going to relieve me. It's going to bring joy. It's, this is going to give me what I crave. And yet, what always happens after it? There's an emptiness. It doesn't deliver. You know, if I'm, if I'm going to that, that website yet again... The, a place that I know I should not be going, but yet I'm thinking in the moment, viewing this, seeing this, it's going to give me life. It's going to satisfy me. There's going to be a relief. There's going to be a sense of intimacy. It's, it's, I, I just got to do it. And then what happens immediately after you do it? Utter emptiness and shame. See, that's the deceptiveness of sin. And see, sin, not only is it alive for what it's going to deliver, it also deceives us so that we cannot see ourselves clearly. Sin blinds us to it. We cannot see it. We, we are not the best view of ourselves. I don't know if you picked this up here in what he says in verse 13, but did you notice there the essential ministry of the body of Christ? Look again at what he says. How are we not hardened by sin? Look at what he says, verse, first part of the verse encourage one another daily. That's a protection against the deception of sin. He's talking about there the ministry of the body of Christ. He's talking about what this word that we use all the time, community. We talk a lot about community. We put it in the very name of the church because we believe it's something essential that God has called us to. See, He's called us to live in such a way that we are encouraging one another daily. That, we, that would require that we know each other, that we're talking to each other, that we're real with each other, that we're open with each other. That's different what, from what we normally think of in fellowship. Normally what we think of in fellowship is covered dishes and chit-chat on our way out the door, right? I mean, so many of us, we want to do church without community. You know, we want to come in and say, hey, let me come in, let me worship, you know, let me hear a good message, and then let me go back to my life. You know, I'm going to come in, I'm going to get what I need, and I'm going to leave and go back to my life. That's not what He's called us to. He has called us to be a part of the body of Christ, to be a part of community. And listen, the picture here of the ministry of the body of Christ is that we would be a people who are speaking into each other's lives. Because the reality is, the deceptiveness of sin means I am not the best judge of myself. It means that I can't see myself clearly. It means that I am a very skilled self-swindler. We're always doing that. And so what do we need? We need one another in our life that's speaking truth to us. That's saying, hey, I see this in your life. Let me be there with you. Let's talk about this. I want to encourage you in this area. I want to open my life to you. I want to know you. That's risky, right? Some of us think, you know, I love people too much to tell them the truth. I love, I love people too much to say anything hard or real to them. And that feels like love to us, doesn't it? That's not love. It's not love. It's indulgence. The only love that that is is self-love. It's loving myself so much that I'm not going to trouble myself with saying something hard to you. That's not what He's called us to. 
So sin, you see, it deceives us. And so we're in desperate need of the ministry of the body of Christ so that we're not hardened by the deceptiveness of sin. But there's even a deeper root to sin. You see that a number of places in the passage. There's something that's like the sin beneath the sin, something that always happens before we choose to commit a sin in our life, and that something is unbelief. That's what he boils it down to here in the passage. Why did the Israelites do this? Why did they bail on God? Why did they go their own way? They did it because of unbelief. Look what he says in verse 19. So we see, and this is after he has described the experience of the Israelites disobeying God, going their own way, coming under his judgment. And then in verse 19 he says, we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. That is always the sin underneath the sin. It's always unbelief. You see, before I choose to commit a sin, before I choose to go my own way, I have to begin to believe a lie. I have to begin to believe God's way is not going to be satisfying for me. I have to believe I cannot trust God in this area. God is not going to come through in this place in my life. He's not going to provide for me. He doesn't love me. That I cannot trust Him in this place in my life. And that is unbelief. And that's where it always begins. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. Before Adam and Eve ate of the apple, what did they have to do? And Satan knew this. They had to choose to believe that God's heart was not good towards them. That's what happened. See, God had given them everything. Everything in the garden is for you. Don't eat of this one tree. And what does Satan come and do? He comes and sows the lie that God is holding out on you. There's something better for you. God's way is restrictive for you. God had given them everything but one thing. And so before they ever ate, The sin underneath the sin was unbelief. God's heart is not good towards me. And that's what happened for the Israelites. God had given them everything. He provided every meal, manna, bread from heaven. You know what they had to do to get that bread? Nothing. (laughs) It just appeared on the forest floor. And then they grumbled and they said, we want meat. Gosh, we remember back in Egypt, we sat around meat pots. Now, that's actually kind of appealing to me. I can get that temptation. I love meat. We sat around meat pots back in Egypt. We had it made. What? You had it made? You were slaves. But that's what unbelief does to us. It rewrites the narrative. We interpret things that we don't have in our life as what we most need, and the things that we do have, well, what is that? It's always unbelief. They rebelled against God. God said, I'm going to take care of you. You know what? On the seventh day, you don't have to work like everybody else. I'm going to meet your needs. You know what they chose to believe? That can't work. If I don't work this day, how am I going to make ends meet? Right? Don't we do the same thing? You know, I've got to, get, I've got to be busy because it gives me meaning in life. How else am I going to be a success? And if I don't do all of this stuff, then it's all going to fall apart, right? Isn't that what we believe? It's unbelief. Now here's what you've got to see. Unbelief leads to sin. And the deceptiveness of sin hardens our heart. You give it time. Just give it time. And those things that used to bother you, those things that were pricking your conscience, those things that you're like, oh, I've got to deal with this. You know what, over time, without dealing with it, without repentance, what begins to happen? It doesn't bother you anymore. You experience that in your life? There's things that used to, man, that tear me up, but now it doesn't really do anything. I think it's okay, actually. So our hearts get hard. Now, here's the thing. When our hearts get hard, we walk away from God. No, you might be, you might still be in church, You might still call yourself a Christian. You might still believe all that stuff in your head. You you might be going through the motions. You might even have a quiet time. But your heart is shut down and hard. And let me tell you something. Theology, it's a warning to covenant students here. 
Theology is a great way to harden your heart. Because it gives you the, the illusion of spirituality. I can know things about God, but I haven't been with Him in a long time. See, our hearts get hard, and we drift from God. We get isolated. Let me tell you something. There is no rest apart from God. We're always trying to do this. We're always, uh, listen, I'm chief among us, chief of sinners. I try to get rest apart from God. You know, I think this trip or this hobby or this entertainment or this escape, yeah, 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 that's going to that's gonna do it for me. It's going to give me rest. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Rest does not come apart from God. So here's the question. How do we find that rest in God? How do we find rest? real rest and that again is in our passage and he's showing us over and over and over the way to find rest in God now this is just really complicated okay and hard to understand the way to find real rest in God is by faith what really yeah faith he says it over and over and over in our passage look at look down at chapter 4 verse 3 now we didn't read this part but look at what he says here now we who have believed enter that rest it is by faith that we enter God's rest it is by faith that we enter his rest now and it is ultimately by faith that we enter the ultimate rest the new heavens and the new earth, the world to come. We cannot enter that rest apart from faith. And what is faith? You know, faith is one of those things. You know, it's a, it's a very familiar, it's a churchy word. It's, it's hard to kind of get our hands around. What is faith? You know, for some of us, faith and believing actually feels like work. But you know what faith is? It's not working. It's not earning. It's doing this. It's resting. Faith is rest. Resting in a person, in their care, in their provision. You know, one of my favorite illustrations of rest is, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, of faith, is that it's like floating. Kids, if, if you ever learned to swim, or if you can remember back when you learned to swim, you know the first thing you have to do when you learn to swim? What's the first thing you have to do? Not rhetorical. Anyone? Levi. I can't hear with the mask on. You have to learn to what? Oh, paddle. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about something before doggy paddling. Yes. You gotta have faith in the person teaching you that you're gonna let you drown. Okay, that's good too. But the person teaching you to swim has to let go, don't they? Yeah. What do you have to do? you got to learn to float. What do you do in floating? You know, I remember, I, I was a slow learner. It took me a while to learn how to swim because I was like a cat clinging to the person teaching me. I didn't trust them, right? I'm like this, you know, fingernails dug in and they have to say, it's okay, you can let go. I can't let go. You can let go. I can't let go. I don't trust you. I don't trust anybody here, right? And then finally I'd say, okay, I'm going to let go. And whenever I let go, I'd panic. What do you do whenever you panic? You sink like a rock. Right? What do you have to do? You've got to let go. And what happens? It's amazing. You float. That's what faith is. It's floating in God. It's floating in His promises. It's floating in what He has done. Not what I do. What I do can't do anything. It's floating in what He's done. It's floating in the finished work of Christ. It's choosing to rest in what He's done. That's where rest comes from. It's resting in Him by faith. It's believing, you got this. You're going to take care of me. You're going to hold me. I can let go of this. I don't have to earn my... I don't have to earn your favor. I don't have to earn the acceptance of other people. I don't have to please people. I don't have to be busy for meaning in life. I don't have to hold my world together. No, God, I'm your son. You've rescued me. You've washed me with the blood of Jesus. 
I can rest in you. That's faith. And that is the only place that rest comes from. Let me just give an illustration from my life of how I've experienced just bringing kind of this whole thing together. You know, I've, I've shared before that Ashley and I have been in a season where we've just been experiencing a lot of growth in, in me personally and in our relationship. We've, doing, we've been doing some marriage counseling and, and really working on some of the dynamics of our relationship. But, but listen, it's been a really hard time and a part of what's been so hard in this time is that Ashley has been trying to share things to me about our relationship. The ways that I'm not seeing her, the ways that I'm not uh, pursuing her, the ways that I'm not giving her attention. And of course, this whole time, I'm thinking to myself, man, I'm an incredible husband. <laughs> because I'm doing my... Di That's, guys, isn't that always, you know... You ask a guy, how's your marriage? The guy's like, oh, we're doing great. Okay, probably a better way is to ask the wife, right? The guy says, we're doing great. The, the wife says, I'm miserable, right? That was happening in our relationship. And I'm sitting there thinking, what, what else do you want from me? Now, I didn't have the courage to say that out loud, but that's exactly what I'm thinking in my heart. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm worn out, I'm doing, I'm keeping all this stuff afloat in my life. I'm trying to take care of all these people. I'm trying to change all these people's lives. That should have been a problem right there. I can't change anybody's life. I'm trying to be a good pastor. I'm trying to be a good father. I'm trying to be a good husband. And frankly, I think I'm doing a pretty good job. What are you talking about here? I couldn't hear it. Why could I not hear it? My heart was hard. I was deceived. What did I need? The ministry of the body of Christ. So one night, Ashley and I go out with some couples in the church. We went out, we're having dinner together, and we really like to talk about real things, and I was hoping we could just keep it at small talk, right? Because I knew, I knew there's something going on in here, and I knew it was there, and I didn't want to talk about it. I knew we were going to end up talking about our relationship, and I didn't want to do that. And so we're having this conversation in a group, and I was getting hard questions asked to me, and I was so resistant in my heart, and I was so defensive in my heart. I'm like, no, this is unfair. Again, no courage to say that out loud because I'm a dutiful good guy, right? But I couldn't hear it. Why couldn't I hear it? Because my heart was hard. But then one night, we go to dinner with Wade and Rachel Anderson in our church, and Wade, in his vulnerability, was encouraging me by sharing his experience of God really working in his heart, bringing him to the repentance, and actually starting to see his wife. Actually starting to see in the, the ways in which he was not seeing her, they were just kind of living alongside each other. And, and God began to change his heart and began to say, man, I see, she's my treasure. I'm pursuing her. That's what God's called me to do. And somehow, in that moment, God began to work in my heart. And we left dinner and we go out and get in the car and Ashley is nervous. She's nervous that I was going to feel defensive like I normally did and I was going to feel attacked and on the spot. And we get into the car and we sit in the car and before I crank the car, I look over at her and I said, I am so sorry. And she said, for what? Now, to my defense, I had apologized so many times I can't even count them. But it wasn't repentance. You ever done that? You know, apologize to kind of smooth things over. But repentance is something very different than that. Repentance is like feeling it. Down deep on the inside, it's like seeing it. It's like, oh, oh, that had happened to me that night. But listen, it wasn't regret and shame. Part of the reason I was always being defensive is because the shame I was feeling in my heart. But yet, some, God had done something in my heart that I had begun to just rest in Christ. That was the miracle. Do you know faith is a miracle? God had done a miracle in my heart. I was resting in Christ. There was no shame. He had taken my shame. And because of that, because of that faith in Jesus, I was able to repent. And I was able to say to her, I'm so sorry. I've not seen you. All that you've been trying to tell me, I haven't been able to see it. That moment has changed my heart. It's changed our relationship. And listen, it ain't fixed. 
That's why repentance is not something you do one time and you're good. Repentance is a lifestyle. But repentance is how we change. Repentance is getting free. Repentance is coming back to God. Repentance is releasing, trying to make life work on your own. And the other side of repentance is faith. It's resting in the finished work of Jesus. And listen, if you really believe that the blood of Christ has cleansed all of your guilt, it's taken all of your shame, then you are free to repent boldly. Let me just close with this here. You know, the writer of Hebrews is a preacher. And he loves to just go right to the heart. I think he might be a Baptist. And here's what he says in in chapter 4, verse 1. He says, Therefore, since the promise of entering His rest still stands, this is possible for you right now. Today. He keeps saying that. Today, today, today. You can enter His rest. But here's what he says. Let us be careful. Let us be careful that none of us be found to fall short of this rest. It's a warning. It's a warning to not fall short of God's rest. So the question is, are you entering His rest? Or is your heart hard? Is your heart hard? Are you so busy in life that you can't even get aware of God? You know, maybe you try to have a quiet time and your thoughts are spinning so much, you know, you just get so frustrated. You're like, I give up. I'm just going to go get something done. Where are you at? Are you experiencing God's rest? You know, it's a very important warning for us because again, and this is especially true in the Bible Belt, we can have all the stuff good on the outside. We can be doing our duty just like I was as a husband. We can be doing all the Christian stuff. We can be going to church. We can be reading our Bible. We can be doing good things and avoiding the big sins in our life. And yet, our heart is hard and we're not entering God's rest. And His warning is, apart from resting in Christ, you will not enter His ultimate rest. There's an important thing to see here in the Bible Belt. There's a common misconception that you can make a decision for Christ at some point in your life that you can walk an aisle and you can pray a prayer and you're good regardless of continually walking with Jesus to the rest of your life. And I, we just, we need to know this because it's everywhere in the Bible Belt. That is a lie. That's unbiblical. He says it right here. He says it to them. Now, this is a community who has embraced Jesus and yet are drifting away from Jesus. And look at what he says in verse 14. We have come to share in Christ if... You see, he's showing you here, here's how you know. Here's how you know you're saved. Here's how you know one day you will enter that ultimate rest. If... We hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Are you holding to Jesus? Are you confident in what He's done? So that's a great way to put faith, isn't it? Faith is confidence in the finished work of Jesus. But that's His question. Are you resting in that? Because if you're not... If you're trying to make it on your own, if you're trying to rely upon your own work, if you're you're trying through busyness to find identity and meaning in your life, your heart might be hard and you might be far away and not even know it. So let's stop there. I've not left us much time. But is there anything you want to say? What's happening in you as we think about this, as we think about hardness of heart? Gosh, I really wish we had more time to talk about this. What's stirring in you? Grace. Um, I think something that I haven't really thought about before, before this sermon, is I think when I think about hardness of heart, um, I usually associate that with anger. 
And I think because, like, I feel anger, but it's not something that I feel a lot, that it's, I haven't really, like, thought about my own hardness of heart. And when you were talking today, I think thinking about it in terms of, like, fear, mm. how often we can harden our hearts out of fear, that I was like, oh, that I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know that really well. Yeah. And I think I just often don't think of how fear leads us to hardening our hearts mm -hmm. and how that's just as sinful yes. as the hardness of heart that comes out of anger. Yes. Um, yeah, so I just really, I appreciated that. I think it mm -hmm. kind of clicked for me in a, in a new way yeah. because of that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Grace. And I, that's, that's been my experience that... that you know, sometimes you can think if there's no major thing going on in my life, I'm avoiding all the big sins, then I'm good. Um, but the reality is our heart can be hard and shut down to God and other people, and yet the outside of your life looks fine. That was my experience. That is also the danger of it. It's deceptive, right? It's hard to see when your heart is hard. But let me close this here. I'm so sorry. Good thing is we get to talk about rest next week. And I'm going to shut up earlier and we're going to talk about it more next week. Okay? So let me pray for us. Father, we are crazy, busy, exhausted, burdened, anxious, afraid. We're trying to make this whole life work and we're barely holding it together, Lord. But there is great freedom in knowing that's all a lie. Lord, would you give us the faith to rest in who you are, in your promises, in the finished work of Jesus that has made us righteous before your eyes. Lord, give us rest that we may truly be able to love one another in the ways that you have called us to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.